This video is brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you wish to support the channel and allow me to dedicate more time to producing such videos, you can do so with a small monthly donation on patreon.com slash Balkan Odyssey. Communism is said to have killed over 100 million people over the span of just 70 years. In modern political discourse, this claim is used as the main catchphrase against the supposedly brutal and authoritarian tyranny of socialism in the 20th century. The first thing your fellow liberal or conservative will fire out when they hear the word socialism or communism. Like most other regurgitated anti-communist catchphrases, this one contains no intellectual honesty or coherent argumentation. This monolithic number in particular can be traced back to the Black Book of Communism, Crimes, Terror and Repression from 1997, which serves as somewhat of a criminal record of socialist states and is there to remind young leftists about the horrors of communism and why that system is destructive and outdated, hence making a passive-aggressive assertion that capitalism has no alternative, that we have reached the quote-unquote end of history, and that all those who are looking for a systemic change at the foundations of our modes of production and social relations are either confused wimps who live with their parents, or malevolent lunatics. This extension of the anti-communist sentiment and the Red Scare serves as a deterrent for many modern leftists from adopting the conclusions of the material analysis conducted by Marx, Engels and Lenin, or deservingly celebrating the many successes of past socialist experiences. These people, hungry for justice and radical change, are frightened into submission by these atrocious numbers and horror stories, and end up becoming contemporary social democrats, democratic socialists, anarchists, or anarcho-syndicalists at best. The left is herewith divided and shattered. Our collective subconscious is filled with flashbacks of terror and Orwellian tyranny from countries and places we never saw with our own eyes. The word communism, or Soviet Union, turned into swear words, reserved only for the naive, uneducated, or ill-intended. The introductory part of this video will tackle and debunk the Black Book of Communism, the pseudo-scientific work which aimed to present 20th century socialism as an inherently destructive and genocidal ideology, which consequently inspired me to analyze global capitalism in the same manner. In the second part of the video, I will present to you my own research and analysis, using similar yet more honest logic and therefore conservative estimates, to calculate a comprehensive death toll of the capitalist system, as a comparison to the allegations which are thrown at socialism. Published in 1997 in France, the book lays out heavy allegations against the Soviet Union and other socialist states of the 20th century. In the introduction, the main editor, Stéphane Coutois, writes that, quote, Communist regimes turned mass crime into a full-blown system of government, and are responsible for a greater number of deaths than Nazism or any other political system." End quote. This claim single-handedly exposes the intentions of the editor. The goal is to push the narrative of the horseshoe theory, suggesting that in practice, Nazism and communism are comparable in their destructive and genocidal intentions, with Hitler and Stalin as evil twins. As Sumas Milne puts it, quote, The clear goal has been to relativize the unique crimes of Nazism, bury those of colonialism, and feed the idea that any attempt at radical social change will always lead to suffering, killing, and failure. End quote. I will definitely be addressing this particular issue in a separate video, as this ingeniously crafted psychological game deserves more attention. When it comes to the Black Book itself, here are some amusing facts. The statistics of victims include deaths through executions, man-made hunger, famine, war, deportations, and forced labor. These famines, for example, are said to have been attempts at deliberate genocide against the state's own population, which is absurd beyond comprehension. 
The death tolls in general rely heavily on definitions of what is to be considered the direct responsibility of the given regime, as there is a big difference between death through genuine state repression and those of hunger, famine, disease, as well as the revolution and civil war in Tsarist Russia and unavoidable destructiveness of World War II and confrontation with Nazi Germany. All this gives us estimates which range from 10 to 110 million deaths, which were based on sparse and incomplete data, with figures skewed to the highest possible values. Moreover, three of the book's main contributors, Karel Bartosek, Jean-Louis Margulan, and Nicholas Wirth, publicly disassociated themselves from Stefan Courtois' statements in the introduction and criticized his editorial conduct. Magolan and Wirth felt that Courtois was obsessed with arriving at a total of 100 million killed, which resulted in, quote, sloppy and biased scholarship. They faulted him for exaggerating death tolls in specific countries and rejected the comparison between communism and Nazism. In particular, Margolan, who authored the book's chapter in Vietnam, stated that, quote, he has never mentioned a million deaths in Vietnam. Furthermore, in Courtois' hunt for the 100 million mark, he has resorted to using the following logic. He counted deaths of Nazi soldiers as quote-unquote deaths by communism, as well as those of Russian Nazis and fascists which were relentless in their attempts to compromise the integrity of the revolution. He counted quote-unquote non-births, aka low fertility rates, as deaths. This means that if a woman used to have four kids on average in the 1910s and only has two kids in the 1950s, those two kids that were never born are considered as being killed by communism. Historian Michael David Fox criticized this faulty logic, as well as the idea of combining loosely connected events under a single category of communist death toll. He openly blames Courtois for the deliberate manipulation and inflation of these numbers. Furthermore, Noam Chomsky wrote that, quote, Supposing we now apply the methodology of the Black Book to India, the democratic capitalist experiment has caused more deaths than in the entire history of communism everywhere since 1917. Over 100 million deaths by 1979, and tens of millions more since, in India alone. And this is exactly what we're going to do in the following minutes. The Black Book of Communism has been even more thoroughly debunked countless times, so instead of wasting time debunking a sloppy, disingenuous piece of propaganda, I will focus my efforts onto my own honest analysis of the number of people which were killed under capitalism in the name of profit. Along the way, I will extensively explain why I consider said deaths as the responsibility of this system. In case you disagree with these claims, feel free to mention it in the comment section and discuss it with others. I'll do my best to actively engage in said discussion and hopefully we can collectively come to an honest conclusion. My attempt at finding a definitive answer to this question is inspired by the Black Book of Capitalism, which came out the following year as a reaction to the Black Book of Communism. The death count cited in this book, however, is far from being conclusive. Therefore, I've taken the liberty to try the impossible, to count all the deaths by capitalism since the Industrial Revolution to modern day. Now, for the sake of having a clear premise, I'm gonna define what is considered capitalism and consequently draw conclusions according to this definition. Capitalism is characterized by the existence of a free market economy, with the private ownership of the means of production, a consequent binary class system of employer and employee, the existence of wage labor and accumulation of profits and endless economic growth as the main motivation and driving force of society. This profit motive requires competition, which incentivizes predatory behavior and corruption, which inevitably manifests itself in imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism, with large corporations and monopolies seeking out new markets in developing countries, which are to be invaded and occupied with the goal of exploiting the nation's natural resources and finding cheap workforce. Ultimately, what does not make money or turn a profit is not worth producing and investing in, 
and that what does will be conquered and exploited without any remorse. Libertarians and proponents of anarcho-capitalism won't be happy with this definition and would argue that what I described is corporatism or crony state capitalism. Once again, I will make a comprehensive and detailed debunking of these claims in a separate video. This definition encompasses not only the theoretical tenets of what libertarians considered capitalism, but rather the material manifestation of the principles of a market economy in the real world, all based on empirical evidence and dialectical analysis of the given material conditions. Systemic violence refers to the harm people suffer from the social structure and the institutions sustaining and reproducing it. This type of violence prevents its victims from satisfying their basic needs, and is an avoidable impairment on the fundamental means necessary for human existence. Systemic violence therefore represents the deliberate lack of the distribution of resources to those in need, for the sake of increasing profits for a small, privileged portion of the population. With the current rates of production, we produce enough food to feed 1.5 Earth populations, which equates to almost 12 billion people. Yet, as of the 2010s, at least 9 million people die to hunger and hunger-related illnesses every year, according to the UN. Ironically enough, Needless starvation is among the most prevalent accusations thrown at 20th century socialism, with the supposedly calculated genocidal starvation which took place in Soviet famines. However, by comparing the material conditions and historical context of Soviet-era socialism and contemporary capitalism, we come to an unmistakable conclusion. The Soviet Union was built and constructed from the corpse of Tsarist Russia, the most backward and underdeveloped feudal society in Europe at the time, in the midst of the most large-scale class struggle the world has ever seen, between hungry peasants and greedy aristocracy. In the years following its establishment, the socialist state showcased the most vigorous economic growth rates and most rampant industrialization the world has ever seen. All this in the wake of the First World War, the Russian Civil War, the absolutely devastating confrontation with Nazi Germany in World War II, and then the economic, political and militaristic isolation and pressures from all sides during the Cold War and imperialist aggression of the United States. Furthermore, the rising new superstate was the first of its kind ever and had no blueprint or guideline upon which to operate, with economic planning and calculations done by hand. The Ukrainian famine and such shortages which struck the Soviet Union and other developing socialist economies were the best possible outcome considering those material conditions, the destruction of war and the political and economic isolation and pressure under which these countries had to operate while staying self-sustainable. On the other hand, the United States and its capitalist world order was established on the extermination and genocide against the Native American population. Its infrastructure and wealth, built through hundreds of years of slavery and the Atlantic slave trade, and maintained through the neocolonial expansion for the sake of securing a cheap workforce and cheap resources in the global south. This imperialist core, including most of Western Europe, has seen exactly zero economic, political or militaristic threats or sanctions, conflicts, coups or infiltrations coming from an external, oppressive, ideologically opposed force. Which comes without saying when you're, you know, the imperialist core. Every single conflict which took place under capitalism had been for the sake of maintaining its hegemony and turning a profit. Additionally, compared to the Soviet socialist experience, modern capitalist nations have all the computing and technological capabilities they need at their fingertips, capable of calculating and distributing resources to those in need within days. Yet, they deliberately choose not to. 
despite living in the most peaceful period of human history with incomprehensible technological and infrastructural capabilities, unfathomable interconnectedness of information, people and capital, and absolute awareness about every single starving person on this planet, we end up choosing profit over human life. This is the capitalist condition. If it's not profitable, it won't be done. However, it's not only passive inaction of capitalists which perpetuates this needless starvation of hundreds of millions of people. It gets even worse. Not only do we passively deny these people basic human rights, with the most idiotic statements that, quote-unquote, saying something is a human right doesn't render it immune to scarcity, but we actively destroy the already produced perfectly edible foods by throwing hundreds of millions of tons of it in containers behind supermarkets and restaurants, because it simply isn't profitable to donate and distribute it to those in need. Some corporations even go so far to pour bleach over these dumpsters so that the homeless and starving don't dare to eat it. In the United States alone, around 100 million tons, or 40% of all produced food, is wasted. Despite the aforementioned technological and infrastructural capabilities, a total of 785 million people lack access to clean drinking water. That's 1 in 10 people on the planet. Globally, at least 2 billion people use a drinking water source contaminated with feces, which is the root cause of diseases such as diarrhea, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, and polio, resulting in almost half a million diarrheal deaths each year. Furthermore, in the least developed countries, 22% of healthcare facilities have no water service, 21% no sanitation service, and 22% no waste management service. This leads us to the next subject of structural violence curable, preventable, and vaccinable disease. It goes without saying that most of these deaths are actively, deliberately chosen not to be prevented, because of the lack of any financial incentive. The pharmaceutical industry is the behemoth which has the power to eradicate this needless suffering and these excessive deaths, yet they choose not only to not help, but to actively harm the population. The COVID-19 pandemic has showcased the inability of capitalism to deal with large-scale health crises as private pharmaceutical companies rush to the front lines of selling masks, tests, and other medical equipment, often in excessive quantities, while lobbying for their mandated use, even when it medically wasn't necessary. On the other hand, this same equipment was not properly distributed to those parts of the world that needed it the most. As the main motive is the private accumulation of profit, the third world countries were prevented from producing their own vaccines and medical equipment, despite infrastructurally being perfectly capable of doing so, as this would hurt the interest of Western capitalist producers. This has led to the deaths of millions upon millions of people who were denied vaccines and medication when they were in dire need. Apply this model to a larger scale, and you'll get a picture of how the distribution of medicine and medical equipment operates in global capitalism, and how it leads to at least 1.5 million deaths from vaccinable disease and 20 million deaths from preventable and curable disease every single year. The next symptom of capitalist structural violence are the approximately 2.7 million deaths every year due to poor working conditions. This includes work-related accidents and diseases, which are often the result of poor regulation and allocation of safety equipment. However, as the International Labour Organization puts it, quote, the gross underreporting of occupational accidents and diseases, including fatal accidents, is giving a false picture of the scope of the problem, end quote. These conditions are the most prevalent in third world countries like India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and African nations. The main targets of outsourcing by multinational corporations looking for a cheap workforce to exploit in order to increase profits. The working conditions of these people in sweatshops are comparable to the horrors of the Industrial Revolution, 
where workers toil away for over 12 hours a day and sleep in the most crowded, unhygienic and inhumane places possible, with no insurance or access to medical treatment. All this for a couple of euros a day. This reincarnation of slavery is very prevalent in the Middle East, in countries like Bahrain, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, where entire cities like Dubai and the upcoming infrastructure for the World Cup in Qatar are built on the backs of literal slaves. Millions of human lives sacrificed for the glamour and luxury of these cities, these symbols of hollow wealth and prestige, the embodiments of everything that's wrong with this world. A somewhat positive development in the awareness in this regard is the increasing number of people who seek to buy fair trade and regional products. Yet, as it's the case with all other forms of commodified progressivism, a large majority of these labels and stickers are not based in material reality. Yugopnik has an amazing video on this topic, on how consumerism presents itself as activism and how capitalist marketing and branding makes you believe you're contributing to some meaningful change within the confines of the current system, without having to step out of your comfort zone. So be sure to check it out. A further recommendation on the topic of fake sustainability and fair trade would be the Netflix documentary Sea Spiracy, which uncovers the deceptive practices of seafood production. Lastly, there has been an increasing rise in the awareness regarding the brutal exploitation of workers working on the stadiums and infrastructure for the upcoming World Cup in Qatar, accompanied with pleas for the boycott of this event. So I'd like to encourage those who planned on buying tickets and flying to Qatar to once more think about the ramifications of their decision. The final bullet point on this list are so-called deaths of despair, which include deaths due to substance abuse and suicide, which account for at least 4 million lost human lives every year. This is often linked with the ever-increasing epidemic of depression and anxiety, especially among young people. The connection between mental illness and capitalism as a socio-economic system is multi-layered and overdetermined, yet undeniable and crystal clear. Alienation is perhaps one of the biggest factors which prevents people from living healthy, meaningful lives, and is one of the main components of the capitalist mode of production, as Marx has extensively analyzed and proven. Alienation at the workplace occurs as a result of the automatization, specialization and division of labor so that each worker toils away at repetitive actions while engaged in the production and assembly of one small fraction of the product, opposed to being engaged in the product's entirety, as it used to be the case in pre-capitalist and socialist manufacture and worker self-management. Having specialized workers, capable of only assembling one part of a product, or conducting one specific task, is not only highly profitable for the capitalist, but insanely effective. This ultimately strips away the meaning behind the labor, mentally disconnects the worker from the product as a whole, and leads to a feeling of being merely one small, replaceable cog in a machine, which we are. Considering the fact that we are forced to sell our labor power for almost half of our day in order to merely survive month to month, I think it's clear how much monotony and hollowness leads to depression and anxiety and alcohol and drug abuse at the very least. A special form of alienation is what Lukács describes as reification. According to him, reification is expressed through the principle of the neutralization of emotional investment, with the rationalization of abstract labor, the mechanization of production, the expansion of commodity transactions, and the calculability of any human operation, all of which tend to disengage individuals from any emotional investment in their own environment. Ultimately, this means that the relation between people takes on the character of a thing, resulting in cold, calculated, mechanized social relations. As a specific form of this reification, what Marx calls commodity fetishism, 
perceives economic value as something that arises from and resides within the commodity goods themselves, and not from the series of interpersonal relations that produce the commodity and evolve its value. In essence, the tens of hours of labor, the working conditions and wages of the worker involved in the production of your t-shirt are the last thing you'd consider when looking at it on the shelf. The main interest and focus of you and the retailer are the exchange of the given commodity for money. Therefore, all social relations involved in the commodity's production are reduced to a hollow glorification of the commodity itself and its exchange value. This commodity fetishism leads to rampant consumerism, where having the next fashion item and piece of tech is a social norm. This materialistic, consumerist worldview further disengages us from other fellow human beings and our environment, which is perfectly characterized in the animated movie WALL-E, depicting a distant future dystopia where humans not only ravage the planet due to their foul practices, but always seek more comfort and more stuff until they become these literally motionless, dehumanized blobs bombarded with advertisements and commodities. In our timeline, this crude marketing is conducted via social networks such as Instagram and Facebook, which are not only responsible for further facilitating this consumer culture, but also contribute to massive amounts of suicides due to reasons which are out of the scope of this video. An honorable mention in this toxic factory of manufacturing consent are self-help and life coach gurus, who profit on your misery and lack of meaning in everyday life, by selling you their quote-unquote services for hefty prices for an illusion of success and progress, sucking you deeper and deeper into the vortex of hustle culture which turns you into an even more consenting, hyper-productive cog in the machine which will not repay you back for your efforts. This machinery is sustained by the naivety that hard work and grinding all day will make you as successful as your favorite billionaire daddy. It feeds on your motivation and your productivity with a golden carrot at the end of the stick that you will never reach, leaving you with this void of self-shame and dissatisfaction. If only you had worked a bit harder, you would have made it, right? All we need to do is to look at this graph, which depicts the increase in worker productivity over the past 70 years, compared to the comparative increase, or should I say, stagnation of wages. The hustle is not only statistically ludicrous, but incredibly unhealthy leading to more profits of the pharmaceutical industry and more deaths of despair. Beyond this phenomenon, suicides are often connected to extreme debt, whether it be insanely large student loans and medical bills in hyper-capitalist economies such as the US, but also debt in third world nations, where workers toil away for months on end without getting their salary, having to take a loan for literally anything worthwhile whether it be sending their kids to school, financing everyday necessities, and let alone daring to purchase an apartment. Besides the individual debt, collective austerity and restructuring programs of newly established neoliberal regimes, as well as sanctions directed at countries which choose not to bow down to the interests of Western imperialism, top it all off by financially crippling the population. Moreover, the material interests of the capitalist create a paradoxical contradiction, where it's in his best interest to pay the worker the least amount of wages for the largest amount of work to maximize profits, but on the other hand he needs the worker to re-inject as much money as possible back into the economy by spending his wages on consumer goods. If the wages are low, which is preferable, consumer output will also be low, which is not preferable. So, how did the capitalists resolve this contradiction? By introducing credit cards, installment plans, loans and various other forms of debt which have become more than necessary to live a decent life. According to this analysis, a total of 38.4 million people die every year due to structural violence. 
Applying this number to the average world population of 7 billion since the year 2000, we come to the conclusion that around 0.5% of the world's population dies due to failures of capitalism every year. In the past 20 years, this accounts to over 760 million premature deaths. But why stop there? Let's apply this logic to the entire time period since the inception of capitalism. Due to the lack of data and for the sake of being generous and conservative, I will consider the beginning of the Industrial Revolution as the actual inception of modern capitalist production. Yet again, we are not even going to consider the fact that the material conditions of the past two centuries have been unfathomably worse than the current ones, including child labor, slavery, horrible working conditions, lack of insurance protection, and other factors. If we were to factor all of this in, the number of 0.5% of the world's population dying annually would be much, much higher. But let's see what happens when we apply this number to the average world population in 150 year steps, starting in 1760. With the most conservative and generous estimates, we come to the conclusion that over 3 billion, 160 million people have died as a result of structural violence within capitalist societies over the course of the past 260 years. Over 3 billion perfectly preventable deaths. We could end this video right here, but we won't, as we still didn't factor in slavery, anti-communist campaigns, the effects of fascism, imperialism, neocolonialism, and the famines and genocides which followed. So buckle up. The American imperial structure, conjoined with the national security state and the military industrial complex, which I've talked extensively about in past videos, have been active in overthrowing dozens of left-wing revolutionary governments across the world. US leaders profess a dedication to democracy, yet over the last 50 years, US national security state has been a key force in overthrowing reformist democratic governments in Guatemala, Guyana, Dominican Republic, Brazil, Chile under Allende, Iran under Mossadegh, Uruguay, Syria, Indonesia under Sukarno, Greece, twice in Greece, Argentina, twice, Haiti, Bolivia, and they replaced them with pro-capitalist military regimes that opened up their markets, opened up their resources, opened up the labor markets to them, and said, come on in, boys, here it is, it's all yours. You just come on in here. It's the free market in the free world. The US has also been active in covert actions or proxy mercenary wars against popular revolutionary governments in Cuba, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Portugal, South Yemen, Nicaragua, Cambodia, East Timor, Western Sahara, and elsewhere. They've been active in forcibly overthrowing reformist governments in Egypt, Lebanon, Peru, Iran, Syria, Zaire, Jamaica, the Fiji Islands, Afghanistan. Before the Soviets ever went into Afghanistan, the CIA was in there through the Pakistanis, ready to destabilize the country. Since World War II, U.S. direct military invasions. Now, not proxy wars, not subversion, not CIA destabilization and terror and death squads, but direct military invasion with U.S. forces. Since World War II, or aerial attacks by U.S. forces in Vietnam, Dominican Republic, North Korea, Laos, Cambodia, Lebanon, Libya, Grenada, Panama, Iraq, Somalia, and now Yugoslavia. When you ask, why are, why are U.S. in Yugoslavia? Why not? They're everywhere else. It's an empire, my friends. It's an empire. And the empire extracts the resources of the republic in order to maintain its imperialist network. By adding all these tragic numbers together, we come to a death toll of at least 7 million lost human lives 
due to US imperialism in the last 70 years alone. This ruthless imperialism is unequivocally a direct embodiment of predatory capitalist behavior, which is described in detail by Lenin in his work Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, and its modern reincarnations presented in the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. In this modern historical context, corporations seek to conquer new cheap labor markets to expand their network of capital and increase profits. While fossil fuel companies can freely extract as many natural resources to turn a profit, while lobbying back home to keep these conflicts and occupations going. Any resistance in the form of a revolutionary socialist movement or democratically elected socialist government will be met with either a direct invasion, a CIA coup, or at the very least, a decade-long blockade forcing the country to become self-sufficient while diminishing its chances of survival. These campaigns are always met with unprecedented propaganda schemes and reports attempting to justify the military intervention, usually riddled with anti-communist rhetoric. Most of the time, the bad material conditions of these countries are used as the main talking point about the horrors of socialism, ignoring the fact that these conditions are caused by political and economic isolation, blockades and destabilization by the imperial core. The quote-unquote authoritarian nature of these regimes is used as a catchphrase for this justification, ignoring the fact that these peculiar islands of socialism would not be able to withstand these imperialist pressures without a strong centralized government. Ruthless in the purging of infiltrators and spies, which aim to destroy it in the name of capital interests. Fascism and Hitler's National Socialism are incredibly mystified ideologies, subject to countless debates about their quote-unquote true economic and political nature. Yet, this mystification is not only dangerous for its relativization of the ideology's external components, the foreign policy, racial pseudoscience and militaristic involvement, but especially for the actual seeds of fascism, which are irresponsibly buried deep underground where they await for the next opportunity to come back to life. The seeds I'm talking about are free market capitalism and liberal democracy. Contrary to popular belief that Hitler was somehow a leftist or a socialist, at least economically, his policies and consequently the material results in relation to capital returns within Nazi Germany show an entirely opposite picture. The rate of return on capital in Germany, their stock market performance, as well as the German capital share, were skyrocketing after Hitler came to power, surpassing even the United States, the most hyper-capitalist country on earth. If that wasn't enough, the word privatization or reprivatization was coined in the 1930s, in the context of explaining economic policy in the Third Reich. What causes confusion in this sense is exactly what Hitler wanted to cause confusion. He named the party NSDAP, Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or National Socialist German Workers' Party. He purposefully instrumentalized the words socialist and workers' party to appeal to the rising revolutionary sentiment in the German population, which was on the brink of a socialist revolution achieving its pinnacle with the Spartacist uprising of 1919 in the middle of the post-war bourgeois revolution which ended up establishing the Weimar Republic, a capitalist liberal democracy. The socialist revolution was prevented after, among other events, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg were shot and beaten to death by the imperialist Freikorps. Nonetheless, the left stayed very strong in the Reichstag and represented an immense threat to German capitalists who sought salvation in Hitler and his authoritarian, capital-friendly policies. Upon their rise to power, the Nazis literally set the Reichstag on fire and used it as an excuse to purge and execute all members of the German Communist Party. So much about Hitler being leftist. The crux of the matter is this. 
Fascism is unequivocally a direct consequence of the failure of domestic capital to defend itself from a rising socialist revolution. These threatened businessmen, without second thought, turned to authoritarian fascists, whether it be Hitler, Franco or Mussolini, to protect their interests. Other factors of capitalist failure that contributed to the rise of Nazism are the recession of 1920 following World War I and the Great Depression of the 1930s, which radicalized both extremes of the political spectrum. These depressions are not accidental bugs in the capitalist market economy, but an extensively documented and well-known feature, a direct result of the internal contradictions of the capitalist mode of production, which lead to periodic boom and bust cycles every seven to eight years. A further contribution to the rise of fascism is the existence of a parliamentary liberal democracy. There will be a detailed video on the failures and inadequacies of bourgeois democratic institutions, but the central point of my assertion is this. Hitler was voted to power democratically. So was Donald Trump. And this is what liberals fail to recognize and admit. As Lenin described in his work, State and Revolution, the state machinery and its bureaucratic pawns are there to serve and protect the interests of the owners of capital. No more, no less. This means that in the wake of a looming socialist movement, seeking to improve the lives of the vast majority, reactionaries and conservatives will push the political spectrum further and further to the right, unknowingly tightening the grip of capital onto the state itself through far-right authoritarian policy. So, with all this in mind, we can comfortably count in the 75 million deaths of World War II, with all the genocide, destruction, war crimes, as a failure of capitalism. In a similar fashion, the imperialist, colonialist and aristocratic conflicts which took place during the First World War are undoubtedly a consequence of capitalist, bourgeois competition and expansionism, leading to an all-encompassing conflict whose preposterousness gave birth to the Soviet Union, the largest revolutionary state the world has ever seen. The natural development of imperialism from capitalism has been extensively analyzed and proven in Lenin's work, Imperialism as the Highest Stage of Capitalism. The ironically named War to End All Wars took the lives of over 20 million people. Furthermore, the war was followed by the largest pandemic the world has ever seen, which took the lives of at least 50 million people. The warring powers were way too concerned about winning the war and showing no signs of weakness, which they accomplished by completely ignoring the raging pandemic, which was decimating everyone's ranks and populations. This act of total disregard to human life only shows the true allegiances of capitalist states that resulted in a mind-boggling death toll that could have been at least halved with the proper allocation of resources towards medical care instead of infinitely expensive imperial conflict. Another gruesome example of imperialist devastation were the Napoleonic Wars, which followed the French bourgeois revolution and took the lives of at least 5 million people. However, the death toll of imperialism doesn't stop at direct international conflict. British rule over India has resulted in over 60 million deaths as a result of man-made famines and mass-scale hunger experiments, all the while shipping Indian-produced goods back to the UK. The Indian Rebellion of 1857 a reaction to the genocidal cruelty of the British imperialists has further cost the lives of at least one million people. Moreover, the man who took the concept of private property to the biggest extremes was King Leopold II of Belgium, who, in 1885, established the Congo Free State as his private dominion. Decades of slavery, forced labor, famines and brutal suppression cost the lives of at least 10 million Africans. Yet this wasn't the end of violence in this region, as the post-colonial racial hierarchies, perpetuated by the colonizers to divide the locals, led to the largest armed conflict in the world since World War II, the Second Congo War, also known as the Great War of Africa, which cost the lives of at least 5.4 million people. 
A further element of this gruesome conflict was the Rwandan genocide, where at least 800,000 members of the Tutsi tribe were subject to mass genocide, all under the guise of the legally complicit French imperial forces. The last significant point on this virtually never-ending list are the victims of the Atlantic and Middle Eastern slave trade, whose lives and existence were commodified and bargained with by wealthy slave owners. The numbers of premature deaths due to slavery is unknown, yet estimates go into the tens of millions. As I already said, this list could go on forever, and we will unfortunately never know the true death toll of capitalism. Yet, at the very least, those were some of the most devastating events of the 19th and 20th centuries. When we take all of this endless destruction of human life into account and put the figures together, we come to a total death toll of over 242 million deaths due to imperialism and fascism alone, two direct offsprings of capitalism. If we combine this with the deaths at the hands of structural violence of the past 260 years, we come to a combined death toll of at least 3.4 billion human lives. Let that sink in for a minute. At the very least, this many lives, personalities, mothers, fathers and children have died to fill the pockets of a few privileged individuals who see the planet as their playground and you as their consenting toy. And then they dare to count the deaths under socialist states, which are struggling to withstand the predatory behavior of the ocean of capitalism around them, forced to stay isolated and self-sustainable. See, socialism never worked. It was never allowed to work. Yet, despite the constant blockades, sanctions, invasions, infiltrations, coups and bombings, it's been scientifically and empirically proven that socialist states provide a better quality of life for its citizens along all metrics, contrary to what's been deeply ingrained into your subconscious. All this despite the fact that these countries, especially the USSR, were forced to waste hundreds of billions of dollars on heavy industry and the arms race to defend the revolution, instead of allocating these resources to providing a more luxurious life for its citizens. But that's a topic for another time. One day, it's all gonna come crashing down on us. These insane contradictions of socialized production and private appropriation. Infinite growth in a finite world. Privatized gains and socialized losses. Rugged individualism within a faceless machine. And the class antagonisms which are antithetical to all notions of democracy. The most amusing thing in this whole story is the level to which we are able to rationalize such an insane system and hold it as the only socially acceptable view on political organization, as the quote-unquote final stage of human development that has no alternative. If we don't become lucid, we will pay. Rapid deforestation terrifying levels of plastic pollution in our oceans, apocalyptic levels of air pollution, overfishing, excessive use of fossil fuels. These are only some of the things that are being done in the name of profit, with total disregard to life on this planet. If we are too blind to see and acknowledge the billions of human deaths at the claws of capitalism, its effects on nature will be too obvious, even to the most heartless, most bribed and most privileged among us. Once all the crops on our fields have been burned, all water resources exhausted, all the ice caps melted and the rising sea levels arrived at our doorstep, it will be too late to have a change of heart. Oh, and all this will happen in your lifetime. You'll probably witness ruthless wars over fresh water resources. You'll see hundreds of millions or even billions of people forced to move inland due to rising sea levels in the next 50 years in what is to become an apocalyptic climate apartheid. You'll witness such abysmal technological and scientific abuse by the rich and powerful 
which, according to many great contemporary thinkers, might as well result in the creation of two separate species of humans, with the lines drawn along current class divisions. There are these sorrowful attempts to rebrand this notion that capitalism can withstand these looming disasters, that it can fight climate change and erase inequality. The Great Reset and the World Economic Forum at Davos are a perfect example of such attempts of greenwashing capitalism, side by side with hundreds of reactionary figures, opportunists and revisionists that are trying to cling on to their privileged comfort zone while vulgarizing Marxist ideas. For those of us who are honest enough towards ourselves and cannot withstand the horrors and injustices directed at our comrades from all corners of the globe, we know what the only viable solution is. And no amount of revisionism, fear-mongering, propaganda, or blackmail will stop us. I remember during the Iraq war, uh, a student said to me, well, that's where you and I differ, you see, because I have faith in the president. He was talking about George Bush. I, I said, excuse me, you have faith in the president? He said, I trust the president. I have faith in him. So what, I said, what does that mean, you have faith in the president? This isn't religion. I mean, you have faith in him the way my Italian grandma had faith in St. Anthony? Do you have a picture of George Bush on your bureau? You light little candles to him, do you? <laughs> Democracy isn't about faith. It isn't about trust. It's about distrust. It's about accountability. It's about challenge. It's about debate. It's about exposure. It's about people becoming the active agents of their own lives, wanting to know what's going on. I don't have to trust you. I don't want to trust you. I want to see what's going on. Whose interests do you really represent, my friends? And yes, we, we, the real we, we, we really do have to do something. Call the White House, call your Congress people, your media, talk back, demonstrate, organize, agitate, educate yourself and others. Let them know how you feel. Don't think they're not interested, my friends. Oh man, are they interested in it. Oh man, do you think they are not watching you all the time? Why do you think guys like me are under surveillance? They want to know what the general public is thinking. They never stop thinking about you. When you say, oh, they don't care what we're thinking. Oh, no, they always, always focus on you because they know they're standing on your shoulders. And if this great mass began to shrug and rumble and all that sort of thing, it gets very wobbly up there. So against the lies... <laughs> against the lies and the homicidal violence of this national security aberration, the thin, frail voice of reason and democracy can become a mighty chorus and a strong resistance. I have seen it happen before, and we can make it happen again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.